we're going to um, kick off um, our MCC Writing uh, Virginia Writers Series event with um, uh, in a, a few words from President Sisson. So I'm going to step out of the way. and You, know, you certainly don't have to step out of the way. But I, <laughs> I, I, I love being able to come and, and usually thank Tom for running the Visiting Writing Series and the tremendous work he's done for decades around inspiring students to write, but today is so different in the sense that it's odd that you are here as part of the Visiting Writing Series, and actually also perfect at the same time. Um, Tom's in the middle of a very busy sabbatical, um, which for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, it is an opportunity for faculty who have dedicated themselves to the institution to be selected to do some work that would feed their soul, advance their work at the institution, their research, uh, their commitment to all of you as students, and certainly that's what Tom's in the middle of right now uh, in terms of having a series of readings uh, about this remarkable book and the opportunity to promote not only his own work, but the work that he does here at the college with students in our creative writing program. So very grateful for that, Tom. And as I said when I came in, it is always wonderful to see you. Um, the magical part of this work is, and I think it's true of all poets, but certainly for you, is the connection to your own memories that makes this uh, haunting work and the connection to New England, which many of us who grew up here see it in many of these poems. And we're just really grateful that you're here today. And I just wanted to thank you for taking the time during a very busy time for you to be part of this visiting writing series and also thank our student engagement office for their continued support. Uh, I think many of you came in the room. If you have not received Tom's book, I think that's part of the attraction of being here today. And for those of you who are seeing on video, you missed out next time you'll come live. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much and thank you for coming in to do this day. Really appreciate it. Phil, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I was actually, um, my idea to have Tom um, be featured as one of the readers for this um, Visiting Writers series um, that we host here, which Tom um, organizes. Um, but this is a really special time to celebrate his work, um, as um, Phil was saying, as an educator, but also as an educator of writing. So this is the, this is, Sort of the fruits of his his work and i know from the, the classroom we're very um, appreciative of him and his work and also now we get to experience his poetry so um, i'm going to introduce tom and then tom will read for about 35 to 40 minutes um, he's agreed to sort of field some questions we're going to awkwardly sort of share this space here uh, when we do that or i'll sit there and um, tom will will um, field those questions or comments um, so uh, we'll begin, since this is recorded, with Tom's bio, which you can find in the back of the book, but um, I think it's important to have down. So Tom Laughlin is a professor of Middlesex Community College in Massachusetts, where he teaches creative writing literature composition courses, as well as coordinating the MCC Visiting Writer Series and Open Readings, which a lot of us have been to also, in contests featuring students, faculty, staff. Um, he was a founding editor of Vortex, a literary journal of Massasoit Community College and a volunteer staff reader for many years for Plowshares, which if you don't know Plowshares, it's a really important literary journal, um, one worth um, continuing to, to read closely. Um, he's also taught literature classes in two Massachusetts prisons. I didn't know that, it's really exciting, I wanna hear more. Um, and his poetry and fiction have appeared in Green Mountains Review, Ibbotson Review, among other reviews, so check out his work. Um, you can actually find it at the opening acknowledgements of this as well, um, where, where you can see where all of his work has been published. Um, so, and, and that might be part of what we talk about after, is sort of the path to um, compiling and bringing together a chapbook and sort of the, 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 the journey towards a, perhaps a full length as well, and um, what that involves. So, so, in one of your other introductions, you talk about how um, your colleagues and your students kind of make fun of you as being a tree hugger. Um, and I was I was thinking about that and, and thinking how um, especially the how how much um, nature and a relationship with nature is present in these works and I think especially um, I, I was I was thinking about the the long titles of James 
write poems and also Li Po and other um, poets um, who became nature, um, became the moment and, and spoke on behalf of it as a, as a conduit um, and bemused by nature and also embodying nature in a sort of sorcerer position. So I do find that here and I'm really excited to hear your work and thank you all for being here to witness together with us. Tom Laughlin. Thanks so much for that wonderful introduction and for Phil Sisson, President Sisson's kind words. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. I have, uh, as Phil said, been on a sabbatical and doing different readings around the state. And uh, that is thanks to President Sisson and Provost Rodriguez and Dean Olson, who uh, helped me to put that together and to, to go forward with a sabbatical proposal that I've been excited about. Um, so it, I've uh, been asked uh, to read in, in different readings where there's a featured reader often and uh, open mic. There are different series around the state. I'll be in Berkshire uh, Community College next week, all different places, but it's really special to be here at Middlesex where for two plus decades, I've been supported by colleagues who have been enthusiastic, have provided, provided feedback on work, um, have really encouraged me to publish my work and to get my work out there. Um, students also, I had in the early 2000s for a number of years, had a creative writing hour on Fridays and alums students, faculty would come and we would uh, workshop each other's work. And so I've thanked them in the book and also my current students and students in creative writing classes in the last six years, um, we write during class at points. Um, they have offered feedback. Their own creativity has gotten me thinking about different things I can do with my own work. So I'm very, very appreciative to, to students, faculty, colleagues, everybody here. Uh, I'm happy to be reading from this chapbook. Um, I first published poetry in the 1980s when I was in graduate school, and I thought, by the time I'm 35, I'll have a chapbook or book. Um, I'm about 25 years late, um, <laughs> but it's better late than never. Um, teaching at a community college, very demanding. Life, family, my daughter. Um, so all those things sort of got in the way but it's wonderful finally to have this book and it's kind of a greatest hits uh, over those many years. There's a poem, uh, actually the title poem was published in 1987 and uh, the most recent poem here was published last June in um, the Somerville Times, lyrical Somerville the poem that they have. Um, this book is dedicated to my daughter Mia who finished UMass Amherst in May, has a full-time job now. She's, yes, a marketing major, but she was one of the officers in the poetry club. And that's what warms my heart, um, a lover of poetry. And my mother, Peg, who was a poet and published some poems in area newspapers on the North Shore. She died of COVID in April of 2020, so it's also dedicated to her. Jonathan mentioned nature and uh, responses to nature. There are different uh, poems in this book. I think of sort of life lessons, uh, memories, as was mentioned by uh, President Sisson, experiences in the natural world, uh, human relationships, family relationships, romantic relationships, and also response poems, poems in response to other poets uh, a favorite poem of mine from another poet, or uh, a work of art or music. Um, a couple of poems in, that I will read today that are in the book, I want to give trigger warnings for violence, the first poem included. First few poems, um, just want to start with some early memories and things that come from sort of my earlier time and place. And so the first 
poem is called Early Lessons. And I grew up uh, 23 miles east of here, in a small town of Topsfield. And I would bike when I was a young teen to a, a farm in Boxford. And I worked on, on a farm. And in a farm, we learned a lot about life. And so this poem, again, trigger warning for violence. If you need to tune out, step out, block your ears, any of that. Um, but this poem is called Early Lessons. I remember a pig chewing on the back of a live chicken on a farm when I was 14. Kicked out of its coop at midday by my pitchfork scraping the crusty floor, it climbed into the pigstall, looking for shade from the yard's burning heat. Patty came quickly, the dogs barking behind to grab the still blinking chicken grunting snouts. Too far gone, he spun it by the neck and held it out to flutter, jerk, then hang limp from his hand. I was driving home to Topsfield during the Christmas holidays at one point, and came on Route 1, which is flat for a long time, to Topsfield, and suddenly these huge rolling hills and fields with horses. And, um, and it got me thinking about the importance of that physical place and ways that I had, uh, how that, that had become part of who I was. Um, and this poem came out of that. It's called Turning Home. Turning Home. These hills have echoed in my ears for decades. Boulder flecked peaks rattling my windy thoughts. Tree birds chirping me higher. I have smelled these fields through my shoulders wherever I pause. Sun drenched blades rippling for wind, rasping every movement, tickling my muscles with hot greenness. These horses have grazed my chest even now, through frosted, crisp December air, tails waving hypnotic symphonies, nostril snorts filling my lungs. This lake has burrowed into my bones, lapping steadily under skin, sky reflecting through turtled fingers, swallowing my muddy darkness. These woods have crackled my feet at every step, oaked messages whispering into souls. Hidden, hidden twigs laughing between toes, pine tops sprouting through my skull. The horrors that we've been seeing across the world have brought home the ways that war affects um, so many individuals killing people in Ukraine and destroying their lives in so many different ways. And those who are left behind also are affected and affected for generations. The, in World War II, the M1 Garand was the rifle for infantry in the army. And those Guns are made for right-handed soldiers, and the shell kicks off to the right. Those lefties, the shell would kick off and hit them in the face or go across their face. So left-handed soldiers were often assigned and trained to use a flamethrower, which is a horrible weapon that shoots a flame 45 yards and burns everything in its path. This poem is called Flamethrower, and once again, a caution, a warning for violence, trigger. Flamethrower. A lefty, the guns weren't made for him, so he became a flamethrower, flushing out foxholes that couldn't be cleared. Children on fire still ripped through his dreams, forcing him down to the kitchen chair at three in the morning for a cigarette 
highball and late movie. I knew only hatred then, standing below that bald leather head, slapped in the face by the crooked fingers of his open hands. Dead bodies, malaria, teeth knocked in, words shouted into arguments too often to sting when intended, burn years later for a flamethrower's son. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, many of my students are often wondering, what do I write about or can't get started on things? And I thought I would just talk a little bit uh, at times about ways that these poems uh, got started and ways that you could start. Um, early lessons is an early significant memory and, and listing life memories and significant moments is a way that you can generate and, and come to things that would be um, helpful and useful for exploring in fiction or creative nonfiction or poetry. Um, family relationships like that with my father, uh, another one to explore whether that's family, human relationships of all different kinds, romantic relationships or romantic poems in here too. And um, things, the turning home poem uh, really came out of a strong, sudden feeling, emotion. And I think thinking about paying attention to those thoughts and those emotions that come to you um, and ways that you can explore those in writing. Um, another thing is, is interest, things you love. And I love jazz music. Um, this next poem is called Jazz. And I was fascinated, I have been fascinated for years uh, with trios, quartets, quintets, uh, improvisational jazz, the ways that there is a central riff um, that they're playing, and the one of the musicians, let's say the guitarist, takes off with their solo and bends and moves those notes in different ways while the others sort of sit back, support that, and sort of look on in awe, appreciating where that soloist is going to go. And then it gets thrown over to another musician, the keyboardist, takes off and bends those notes and makes them their own, and that competitive, playful, wonderful uh, experience is something that I wanted to write about. And I thought that would be great to have a poem. And I couldn't think for years and years. And I was driving north on Route 1, um, one August evening. And Eric Jackson, who just passed away a few weeks ago, was a famous jazz DJ in Boston, WGBH Radio, Eric in the Evening, for 40 years, and was listening to him. And suddenly, the beginning of this poem and the idea for this poem came to me. I pulled over into a gas station, looked around. I usually have everything in my car, anyone who knows me. Um, but I, I had cleared it out for an event um, that I had uh, done, and I didn't have any papers. So I ran into the gas station and said, do you have any paper? And the guy was like, paper? What the? You know, no. I said, well, anything to write on. And he, he said, uh, I have these old gas slips. And he reached under. And those of us old enough, there were these charge slips that we use in gas stations. And he had these old, I said, these, I'll take them. So somewhere in a file at home, they're scribbled all over gas slips, the beginning of, of this poem. And it is called Jazz. Find it here. Jazz. Dancing boy, dancing girl, and a boy again, tiptoeing on the wooden raft, circling as it sways, he circles and it sways in the stillness of the creek, around and to the diving board where he rattles and thumps and springs, twirling, floating up and out and curving down to slice and splash, then explode up and out, splashing, shouting, laughing at the moon, swirling in the hot summer dusk, thrashing and kicking with smiling wetness before climbing the ladder to sit back, smile, and watch to see the girl tiptoe on the swaying dock, circle, no, not circle, almost circle to the edge, then almost circle again as the creek stills, ripples slightly, 
anticipation. Her footsteps pat the dampened wood. She finds the worn wooden board, bobs up, rattles, rattles, and slaps, running to take that board, bending, springing as part of her, part of the swing of her arms soaring upward. The slow, subtle arc and twist of her naked shoulders outward, twirling, floating, flying, outward and down, slicing unexpectedly, swallowing her reflection, toes pointing to the last. The aching, unruffling pause before, exploding up, smiling, laughing to herself, to the raft, to that hot mooned August day. And she turns, splashing, suddenly racing toward the reaching branched shore tree. The boy now unfolds his sitting to sprint, thumping and springing out over out quickly over creek water, spraying strokes, pushing in pursuit of the laughing hare, reaching toward the rooted wild grass bank. She grabs the knotted rope past the thick trunk, up the dirt path, pausing, deep breaths jump, holding, hanging, swishing beyond trunk and path, whistling wildly over grassy bank, then water, then over the boy, half out of the creek, caught in a broadening smile of awe and appreciation, watching the arcing girl as she sails, then dances on her smooth watered reflection. Yeah, and that was written about a love and something that we all could think about, what we love and what we enjoy we might write about. That's also a kind of a response poem, responding to that music. Um, I also have poems I mentioned that are response poems in here, poems to um, that are responding to a favorite uh, po poem of mine um, by a poet I love. Mary Oliver uh, is one of my favorite po poets, uh, won the National Book Award. She passed away in 2019, but I was able to see her in 2010 at Wellesley College uh, with Mia, my daughter, and Peg, my mother, and other family members who are big fans. And um, so she died in 2019. I'm a big open water swimmer and uh, swim at Walden and other places from early May through, uh, through Halloween at least. I made it to November 7th uh, this year because it was extra warm. Um, but I had an experience swimming at Walden Pond that reminded me of Mary Oliver's fa famous poem called The Summer Day. So I'd like to read her poem and then my response poem. The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. The one who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And my poem is called The Late Summer Day. It is for Mary Oliver, the late summer day. Halfway across Walden Pond, the mid-September sun, bright above the tree line, reflects off the smooth surface and warms my squinting face as I swim, my hands reaching gently through the clear water of this late afternoon. The thickness of woods along the shores holds me in its arms, as I turn to swim back towards sandy shore and the old wooden bathhouse basking in light 
with the speckle of old swimmers and beach chair readers. Floating in the water just ahead of me, a small stick or piece of trash distracts me until closer I see the light green bars, <coughs> the orange stripe, and the small legs of a grasshopper, motionless. How did she get here, far out in the middle, with no grass or land in sight? No boats today with a fisherman who may not have noticed a quiet stowaway. And how have the trout, bass, and pickerel missed this tasty morsel? I reach to cut its body in one hand, water draining through my fingers, to see and feel the hair-like front legs and feathery body, until it jumps, alive suddenly. How? Landing just ahead, back on the water. I'm the only island in sight, I think, and slower this time, cut my hand and lift, gently carrying her toward the top of my head, where she steps on, clinging to my wet hair, holding my neck and head as still as possible on the long swim in. I feel her move through my hair, climbing to higher ground, perhaps, and I wonder what she sees from her perch with those enormous and complicated eyes, and whether Mary Oliver ever carried a grasshopper on her head. As my feet touch sand, my head rising with its passenger, I walk slowly out of the water, across the sand, past toweling swimmers and a curious child, up to the stone-walled ledge, where I bow my head to the thick blades of green beyond, feel the small snap of her back legs, and see her fling herself back into the grass. Thank you. This next poem is called Mistress. Mistress. She arrives quietly every month, catching me unaware outside my office door, dusk quickly spreading on my way to car, home. The sight of her distracts me, the night's air warm and musky, damp from a week's ground soaking rain. My car, too, conspires, finds the too familiar darkened lot, my footsteps soundless, fearful, feeling now toward the concealed path, the gnarled protection of ancient limbs, long versed in such escapades, smiling, these pungent urges. As I climb steadily, <clears throat> pulse throbbing at my temples, she whispers through the pines, winking suggestively between splayed branches, behind, beside, around the distant beyond of this great dark hill. So I find myself here again, atop a craggy-faced rock, gazing at her naked glory, bright and unabashed, ever the tease, hovering beside Orion's belt, and laughing now with his pale and hungry lunatic. Thank you. Uh, for years, I consistently uh, hiked Great Blue Hill on full moons um, with alone or with others, and that poem came out of that. So thinking about things that you do and things that might take you in writing directions. This next poem is a relationship poem. It's called Elements. The winds pick up every time we make plans. Rain swirling sideways and pounding streets, opening coats, soaking pant legs, socks, shoes, umbrellas useless each night as we leaned, winded, tossed right then left, splashing toward restaurant, sports bar, billiard hall. We shook hair and draped dripping coats, laughed tentatively over soggy clothes attempting to dry under tablecloth or bar stool. Still, the storm raged, wind and hail waiting outside for our attempts to reach car, train, coffee shop, apartment. In time, our forced laughter was no match for the forces darkening our every meeting leaving forecasters dumbstruck. 
reduced to the rawness of telephones, dampened conversations where dreams of clear-skied, lilac-scented strolls remained unspoken. Our connections grew hazier, the line crackling with snow until our final trailing off into a puddle of silence. that uh, came out of dating experience, but then sort of imagining um, and going to sort of magical realism uh, extremes a little bit. So thinking about where your, your imagination can take you uh, in your own writing. Um, Jonathan mentioned my love of trees and the fact that um, people call me a tree hugger. Uh, and I call myself a tree hugger at times. And I got thinking about where that came from. I hike every day or I'm in nature every day, but woods and trees are really important to me. And I uh, got thinking about where that came from um, and started writing and ended up coming upon a memory, an early memory, uh, when I was a child that I'd forgotten about. So this poem is called Dendrophile, which means lover of trees. They were our jungle gyms, our hanging bars, our hobby horses, our August cooling tents, our winter snow shakers, our climbing walls, our mountain tops, our citadels. They surrounded us as we ran, chasing each other past their sappy bark over pine needle thickened paths, the forest floor squishy with mulch and the fibrous reaching roots of these silent sentinels standing watch over our boyhood selves as we grabbed for sticks at our feet. Broken branches weakened by boring insects, chiseled by birds bashing their hungry heads and cracked loose by the weight of winter. Swinging and slamming these against trees, snapping pieces that spun in the air, flying past ecstatic eyes and nearly clipping our crew-cutted heads. And whose six-year-old challenge was it that day which set us attempting to climb pole-thin pines with their pencil-pointed stubs of branches long choked off by the thick canopy of green high above? Grabbing scratchy trunks, we stepped carefully, slowly, easing our weight onto one bone-dry stub, then another, the height competition continuing until a brittle crack to suddenly drop us, tumbling to pine needle floor. Then, unthinking, my sights on bragging rights, I reached up one stubble trunk, hugging too closely its scratchy bark as I climbed until the crack, the sudden drop, the unseen sharpened stub slicing as I pole slid toward forest floor, a thin red line from my belly to chest. Afterwards, the stitches, the bandages, the long torso scar were show and tell exhibits until puberty and chest hair and decades erased any visible sign of that first woodland infection when sap began running through my veins. I love the poet James Wright, and he often has these wonderful, delicious, long titles. Um, I have a response poem to one of his poems uh, in this book. Um, the title is Lying in a Hammock on James Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. And I love these big, long titles. Um, but um, this is a short love poem with a very long title. And I want to say that it was first published in Dead River Review, the literary journal here at Middlesex Community College. And a student, I sent in a few poems. I was encouraging my students to submit. And I said, oh, I better put my money where my, my mouth is and uh, send some things in. And actually, the editor helped me to take the first line of the poem and move it up into the title and make it a longer title. And it was wonderful. And I thought, a student tell me. Wait, that makes sense. That really works. That's good. So the title of this poem is called 
Finally, beyond the pine tree back roads of my morning commute, I think of you early this September morning. The bright sun kisses the cornfields that I pass, grown tall and stretched near to bursting with plump kernels of sweetness within, golden gems that sparkle and spill out over the tops, yellow happiness dancing like fireworks against a green stocked sky. Because of you, I too feel these golden gems, this yellow happiness, this full heart bursting into dance. Um, I have been doing readings and uh, summer and fall readings and it's wintry out right now, and uh, I haven't read any winter poems. I have winter poems in here. And I thought I would read um, another response poem. Um, I wrote this poem in January, a January poem, and after Christmas, and ended up feeling later, hmm, there's echoes here of a poem that I really love by Wallace Stevens. And so I feel I may have been influenced by that. So it was a different kind of, not a conscious response, but more of an unconscious response to um, that. And I'd like to read his poem first. And he was a poet who lived in Hartford, Connecticut. And I imagine with this uh, poem that he was walking at night. I love to walk at night and looking at the houses and thinking about the conformity uh, within and the sort of regular fences and the regular things. So this poem is called Disillusionment of Ten O'Clock. The houses are haunted by white nightgowns. None are green or purple with green rings or green with yellow rings, or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange, with socks of lace or beaded cinctures. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here or there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in red weather. Love that poem. In my poem, I call Disillusionment of January 10th, with a nod to Wallace Stevens' famous poem. Disillusionment of January 10th. Spent Christmas trees lie naked on sidewalks, embarrassed, unable to stand, their sappy stumps exposed, skirtless now. Frozen phantom roots no longer twitching toward soil a branch length away from their asphalt slabs. Beyond the closed front doors, colored lights flicker only from flat screens onto winter-paled faces of couched men, their women binge-watching in kitchens, offspring shooting car thieves or texting catfish in separate rooms. The town beach lot has been empty since summer. A ball of dirty snow, the only thing parked now in a shady corner. Metal signed warnings askew on the chain linked gate. The full bellied lake is still in watery motion. A child's jostled black bucket of blue green, sprinkled here and there with white foam, shards of yellow sun, gentle palms of wind sweeping the surface. Where lake meets crusted sand, fall leaves have tangled themselves into frosted clumps, a splayed brown line, ice manacled in their final attempt to return home. The wind-chilled beach ends at a small, unkempt cove where a boat dock sticks out its long tongue, laughing at the crooked remnants of an old stone retaining wall and overgrown banks holding back hills of dark earth trees. The shallow protected cove is topped with a layer of ice, thinned 
to wine glass along a curved edge, but resolute in its, in its efforts to stand firm against the clumsy hands of open water, while dozens of its watery trinkets, floating fragments of delicate ice, roll together with each rippling wave, tinkle and jingle rhythmically against the cove's glassy ceiling. The ethereal sounds resonating out along that crystal instrument, like winter wind chimes or the distant bells of a magical sleigh. I um, thought I would read some poems that are, a few poems that are not in the book. Um, it was mentioned that I taught in a couple of prisons in Massachusetts. Um, and in the last few years, one of my former students has been in the news quite a bit. And finally, his sentence was commuted uh, this past January, January by the governor and parole board met in May. He had been in prison for 30 years um, unjustly. And um, that got me thinking about my prison experiences and deciding to sort of explore some of those and write. And um, I'd like to read a couple of those. And then uh, a short poem that was published just a few days, or was accepted for publication a few days ago. Um, first poem is called Going to Prison Tuesday Nights. Released from my office on a tree-lined college campus, I cruise the colors of the city and further west down narrowing roads. In a thick band of woods, South Walpole's Winter Street forgets its name passing over the Stock River to become Clark Street in Norfolk, where the trees drop away for barren fields like an empty moat before high stone walls topped with razor wire. Inside, sealed behind six coats of light neutral, the cement block walls have stopped dreaming of sunlight, the twin fluorescent bands overhead their only friend. The speckled gray linoleum floor won't talk even when scuffed by the desk chairs brought in to impersonate a classroom or when I arrive during 6 p.m. movement. But with the door closed and COs nowhere in sight, voices echo so eagerly that I strain to hear the student beside me. And um, this poem is about that former student. And um, I have a writing group, and I had done this huge, long amount of narrative poem that was nowhere near finished, and it was already three pages long, and showed it to my writing group. And they, they said, you've got to do something to cut this, you know, whatever. And so I um, decided to uh, do something extreme and try a villanelle. And a villanelle is a very strict form with repetition and rhyme. Um, and so I tried to take all that and make it into a villanelle. And I'm pleased to say that that poem was accepted by Ibbotson Street just uh, last week. So I'm very pleased that it finally will be published. And I thank you. And I want to, when I have a copy of that, I'll track down that student. I have a connection. My niece works in a program for prisoners who are, uh, are out now. Um, and want to hand that journal to him, track him down. Prison class. In any other culture, he'd be a prince, whispered the guest writer I'd brought to prison that night, knowing of his poor court-appointed defense. A bright high school athlete with a mother from Port-au-Prince, he became a marine to keep college in his sights, though in any other culture, he'd be a prince. On leave, his warning shot above the bat-waving mob was self-defense, fleeing a party detonated by a racial fight. But his was a poor court-appointed defense. Inside gray walls, the young man spoke with quiet confidence of Welty, Faulkner, Baldwin, and Updike. I felt in any other culture, he'd be a prince. At trial, no ballistics that might have proved his innocence but a white man was killed that day. A shame, 
about the poor court-appointed defense. Decades he's been behind walls ever since the judge gave him natural life. In any other culture, he'd be a prince, but instead he got a poor court-appointed defense. Um, and another poem that was published a few days, or uh, accepted for a few days ago to an online journal um, called uh, The Orchard's Poetry Journal um, is called Walking After a Snowstorm with Kobayashi Isa. And Kobayashi, Kobayashi Isa was a famous Japanese uh, poet. He lived um, 17, 1800s, early 1800s was one of the sort of uh, major haiku writers, um, the four greats. Um, and uh, so this came about after reading some of his work and after a snowstorm. It's called Walking After Snowstorm with Kobayashi Isa. The neighborhood spruce frosted against a blue sky. Puff of snow a druid's pipe hidden beneath boughs. White pines, delicate fingers flicker with sunlight. Their rays warming taps, snowy house of cards downward. Mist sparkling now in the breath of this birdless day. And um, how are we doing on time? One more? Good. So um, maybe I'll end with um, the title poem. I was a student at UMass Boston and um, used to jog the peninsula there where JFK Library and uh, UMass Boston are. And I got um, observing and thinking and the rhythm of running and looking at those details daily and got thinking about uh, Imagining an old time or someone who grew up in that area sort of walking someone through and showing them um, the sights. And um, an old timer uh, somewhere like my age, I guess now. Um, so this, uh, this is called The Rest of the Way. Start here, just beyond the chain fence on the back street. It turns to footpath ahead and left along the water. There's wild grass and seagulls, and the path breaks down into dirt around a boarded up pump house. Look at the islands out of ways and bridge connecting two with the mainland. The dock by that white house there has boats sometimes, visitors. Breathe in seaweed, even dead fish smells, but don't stop. Round that corner, the city large across the bay, above the beach where old men swim naked every day, even through winter. The steps of stone are wide but low. They curve, too, like a rising tunnel, pulling you to streets and long-needled spruce that reach, asking for the brush of a hand passing. Down the slope, past the field that fills with pheasants in spring, go right, and you'll recognize the rest of the way. Thank you. space for any comments or feedback and invite those from you all. Um, Love to thank you questions so or comments. Yeah, questions or comments. Yes, please. What's the poem about the tree and how you were up there and you slid all the way down? It was so cool to hear. Oh, that makes me so Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. An early memory, you know, yeah. that little kid. Did. The one poetic license that I took in that poem. <laughs> and that is, um, Stitches. Mm -hmm. I had that like they did like special tape and all this kind of stuff. It was a big you know cut here, yeah. all the way here. Yeah. But it wasn't stitches. But somehow you know it taped on the block. You know anyway. So it was easier to say stitches. But it was that you know like that. So, you, you. you just remembered it randomly like one day. And then well, I was thinking back and I started writing and then I 
you know, remembered that. And it's, it came out in the writing and thinking about why I love trees and sort of, I don't know, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, what was that? <clears throat> and it was, a, it was something, you know, I'd show people for a long time, but then, you know, I'm old. <laughs> Um, how did you get started teaching in prisons? Very good question, yeah. Um, well, when I did teach, um, Pell Grants, which support students here and others, low income, um, were applied for by inmates in, in prisons. And there are different college prison programs. And I was teaching and working at Massasoit Community College down in Brockton. And they had courses at night program in uh, MCI Norfolk, in Bay State Correctional Center, which is right next to it. It was, that's a long history, but it was built after the Willie Horton uh, fiasco. Um, so I ended up, uh, I never, two things I want to avoid more than anything in the world, and that is war and prison. And I never thought I would ever step into a prison, but um, people said, oh, it's, it's okay, you know, I don't know. It's so um, it was a really powerful experience and uh, really made me appreciate so much trees and other things. Every day driving on these roads and seeing nature and horses and other stuff and thinking about all those things that those people cannot see. That's really so, thanks. Any questions? Yes. yes. So I have to know what did that grasshopper symbolize to you? What that grasshopper symbolizes. You don't know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, there are those moments, and, and it, it, did, it did feel like, you know, I, I'm a very spiritual nature person. Uh, I'm not necessarily a, I'm trying to be open to, you know, my mother being out there, other things, maybe, I don't know. But maybe, uh, I don't know, Mary Oliver might have placed it there for me. I don't know. So it certainly made me think of her and, and her amazing poem. And I, I want to say um, there's more to that. Um, the importance of that poem and connections to Middlesex as long as I'm here. Um, I thank in here Carol Dundorf, who was um, in professional development um, many years ago, and she worked on the Bedford campus and helped me when I first started to get some summer mini grants to do different projects to create a website for the English department for doing different things and get some money. She was a wonderful woman, and we used to have these open readings that were um, people's own work, but also people celebrating poems, um, favorite poems and things. And so faculty, students, others would sign up for it. She would always volunteer and email me, oh, I want to read. She would read a couple of poems, and she would always read The Summer Day as her second poem. She would read a Billy Collins or something else. I was new to the college three, four years. She was a delightful woman. I got to know her better. She had been a teacher in the past, but very elegant woman. But she had, she and her husband had built their house. They lived in the cellar hole with their children while they built the house. And there's really ruggedness there. Um, but I found out she was dying of cancer. And it had come back, and she had decided to go back to work. And Dean said, You don't have to work. And she said, I, I really feel a lot of purpose here and ways that I affect the teaching and learning of students here and professors. And so she kept working. So I didn't know that. And when she passed, there's a tree in Bedford. You know that tree again. That is uh, a plaque that was to her. But I went to the service. And she had been dying for a while. And her son grown son and her husband had carved her casket. And on the side of the casket, in beautiful scroll, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I was bawling my ass off. Yeah. <laughs> Very important thing. I have one question. Sure. It's, you know, a little bit more of a formal question, yeah. just in terms of the um, assembly of the chat book and sort of the selection of the poems. I guess I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how you've conceived of this as a chat book, um, how you've ordered the poems, 
sort of formal movement um, as you move from type of poem to type of poem, also from genre of poem to genre of poem. How did you assemble this? Um, what's the through line? What's the connection? If this is a sort of best or greatest hits, what holds it all together? That's a great question. Um, I uh, There's a lot there, I guess. I'm not sure about a thread through. The, the dendrophile and my nature connections are certainly uh, you know, evident uh, throughout. Um, which are sort of spiritual nature of connections, I guess, through. Mm -hmm. But um, I tried to gather sort of the greatest hits. I had other poems published, but I just thought these were the better yeah. ones, I think. And I used my brother, who's a, a poet and in my writing group, and has always been my first reader. But I wanted to balance things. There's, you know, that, that uh, flamethrower poem is early. There's a, a, another father poem about the middle, and there's another father poem later so trying to not hit I wanted to sprinkle those throughout um, different forms have a varying reading experience so that they're shorter and longer and you know different forms um, the jazz and dendrophile have that sort of performance poet feel a little bit and influenced by my listening of performance poets and some of my students um, and so those are you know different places so thinking about sort of spreading those things out um, some and he helped me sort of choose and do some things and um, I don't know. What do you think? And I guess a follow-up sure. question um, is is sort of how do you are you thinking of building to a full length um, manuscript from this or like do you see this chapbook as standing on its own and separate from a larger project? Yeah, I guess I see it as standing on its own and and I certainly have many many more poems and I've been writing more this um, with this uh, sabbatical. So I do envision maybe another chapbook or a full length sometime uh, of different poems, um, not necessarily this. Um, so I feel like this stands on its own a little bit. Yeah. And I just have like one other question sure. in terms of white space, which in the jazz poem, I don't know if you all got to see yeah. that page, like, um, but it's not the only instance where you make use of, of white space, also in hindsight, hindsight and other yeah. poems. So like, um, how did your, and, and also with your use and your eschewal of punctuation in some instances mm -hmm. where you leave, you know, full stop out of it altogether, and sometimes your stanzas equal sentences, um, sometimes you cram together into um, what might be stanzas into one big long stanza. How do you arrive at these sort of formal decisions in play? Like when does it become necessary, for example, to use white space as you do in order to do something on the page that otherwise couldn't be done without it? Yeah, I guess um, things like, like jazz, I'm trying to play with the sounds and um, think about helping someone to read it maybe in some ways that I read orally um, and have that feel of, of the jazz movement and the playful jumpiness, uh, you know, I guess with that. Hindsight, um, you know, the hair is whipping away, so you know it's sort of the stanza that's, you know, whipping away and playing with that. I think um, other I, I do look at you know form matters and you know the stanzas, uh, you know, different ones. Um, I have to look, but in terms of like mistress is probably you know equal stanzas that the, the number of lines um, that I that I may look for for a reading experience for balance. Um, the Punctuation, I think, end punctuation on end of lines, because it's sort of a stop place, I, I sometimes leave them off, and I, it's, it's, I, it's not a system one way or the other. I go back and forth, so try out different things and see what I like, that particular poem, maybe. Yeah. Um, the one I read, um, well, actually, there's a poem in your father's, le father's Lessons, which is all a couplets, yeah. um, and they're different lessons, but choice of that there's short lessons but also there's father and son you know and the um the walking after snowstorm with kobayashi isa um originally was one long stanza but then i made it into couplets and sort of us walking he, you know isa and i walking together so and that one um is not haiku but each line is either five 
or seven, it's five, seven, you know, throughout the whole poem. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I chose to, you know, honor him in that way. So, yeah. I, I wanted to say, you know, you had asked earlier, just or somebody asked about publishing and that sort of thing and the process of that. Um, and I, it, it is interesting, you know, thinking about, but I guess I had been submitting here and there and not enough. Um, there was a, a, a writer that was a visiting writer here, and we've had multiple visiting writers have had chapbooks and things. I was reading and buying their work um, in advance and getting prepared to choose uh, different writers. And I saw this chapbook they had and went to the, to the, to the uh, site where the, to order it and saw that they were having a contest and, you know, to enter. And um, so that's what prompted me to say, you know, I, gotta, I, I can put together, you know, I want to put this together with summertime and I put together. Um, and that company sort of fell apart for a few years. And so I never got a response, I tried. But I ended up, you know, submitting it to Finishing Line Press. Mary Buck Bookinger, who read for us and others, have had Finishing Line Press and, and were pleased with it. So um, they had a contest and I submitted that and didn't win. But I, they asked me, you know, to, they wanted to publish my book. So, and I hadn't, I had about 10 of the 22 poems that had been published previously in this book, but the process of getting that published, I thought it would be a few months, and it was, they said, oh, this was January 2021, and they said, oh, here's the schedule, and the schedule was like March of 22 was this, and then finding, coming out in July, August of 22, and I said, why, well, I've got a lot of time, and I said, I'll send out some of these to see if I can get them published in literary journals in the meantime, and so uh, yeah, 20 like, of the 22 have been published. Yeah, 15 of 20. Yeah. Yeah, of the 22 poems. So, yeah. And then did you end up publishing the same manuscript that you su submitted? Or I did, did yeah. Changes? So, and, and they had accepted that. And mm -hmm. so, um, but, you know, it, it, there was so much time it had an opportunity to say, okay, I could get them out to journals too. And then thank them, you know, acknowledge their uh, original publication. So, do it that way. Interesting. Cool. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you to everyone for being here. And being thank part you. Of this event.